Ave Maria. At the name of Jesus, St. Paul says, every knee should bend, those in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. Everyone, every knee, in heaven and on earth. We want to talk about the demons and the angels. Da -da 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 -da. Demons can be scary, uh, but we discover that they are under Christ and we have nothing to fear. And so we want to look today at verses 19 and 20 of this passage of St. Paul to the Colossians. Uh, and in that section, he speaks, he uses a word that is often translated as reconciled, uh, apakotelaksai, uh, not easy to say, but a Greek word that means to lead into unity uh, under a, a certain goal. Uh, and so if we look using the Greek sense of this word uh, at the translation uh, of the St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, St. Paul says, For it has pleased God the Father that in him, in Christ, all his fullness should dwell, and that he should lead all things to unity in Christ, whether on the earth or in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross. So all things in heaven and on earth are led into unity under the headship of Christ. Christ is the goal, the Alpha and the Omega, as we spoke of in the last episode. Uh, this brings us to a question about the angels. Uh, are the angels uh, seen as under the headship of Christ, which would be the Franciscan perspective, that God first willed the Christ, the Word made flesh, and then willed angels and men to be blessed in him through his mediation? Or rather, are the angels directly under God, uh, and then fallen mankind is under the headship of Christ? In which case, the angels would be under the headship of Christ insofar as he's God, but not so insofar as he is man. Uh, Let's look at an exorcist. They send, seem to know something about demons and have experience with this. Father Gabriel Amorth, the chief exorcist in Rome, who even performed an exorcism with Pope John Paul II in, during his lifetime in Rome, uh, he comments on this uh, importance of Christ in our understanding of the angels. In his book, An Exorcist Tells His Story, before he tells his story, he recapitulates a few things about creation. Uh, and this is what he says. I'm going to read this whole two paragraphs, and it's very enlightening, very, very helpful for our subject matter here. Father Gabriel writes that all too often we have the wrong concept of creation, and we take for granted the following wrong sequence of events. We believe that one day God created the angels, that he put them to the test, although we are not sure which test, uh, and that as a result, we have the division among angels and demons. The angels were rewarded with heaven, and the demons were punished with hell. Then we believe that on another day, God created the universe, the minerals, the plants, the animals, and in the end, man. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve obeyed Satan and disobeyed God. Thus they sinned. At this point, to save mankind, God decided to send his son. Father Gabriel Amorth goes on. He says, This is not what the Bible teaches, and it is not the teaching of the fathers. If this were so, the angels and creation would remain strangers to the mystery of Christ. If we read the prologue of the Gospel of John and the two Christological hymns that open the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, we see that Christ is the firstborn of all creatures. Everything was created for him and in expectation of him. Father Amorth says, There is no theological discussion that makes any sense if it asks whether Christ would have been born without the sin of Adam. Christ is the center of all creation. All creatures, both heavenly, the angels, and earthly, man, find in him their summation. On the other hand, we can affirm that, given the sin of our forebears, Christ's coming assumed a particular role. He came as Savior. The core of his action is contained within the Paschal mystery through the blood of his cross. He reconciles all things 
in the heavens, that's angels, and on earth, man, to God. The role of every creature is dependent on this Christocentric understanding. So this brings us to the Franciscan school of thought on the test of the angels. If from the beginning, when they were created, they were meant to be led to unity under God in Christ, under his headship, this would indicate that the test of the angels was to serve Christ and his Immaculate Mother, the King of the Universe, and his Immaculate Mother, the Queen, or to reject this plan of God. And we know that Satan, uh, when he was tested, he said, non serviam. So the Franciscan thesis would say that the angels, good and bad angels, were given the test. They were shown in a vision, an image of God's plan, the woman with her offspring, uh, who would be the eternal Son of God, and that they would have to bow down and worship and serve Jesus Christ and to venerate and serve his Immaculate Mother as their queen, to which the evil spirit said, Non serviam. We know the good angels said, Who is like unto God? Who is like unto God? What a marvelous mystery that he would elevate created nature and obviously elevate not only man, but angels uh, in the mystery of the word made flesh. This is a, a point that is very beautiful and I think helps us to understand the separation of the angels, both the good and the bad, and why the bad angels hate us so much because of our dignity in Christ, because they rejected the plan of Christ, his headship, uh, they have a great hatred for us. So we pray to our Lord, we pray to our Blessed Mother, Queen of the Angels, and our Protector, Protectress, and we pray to our Guardian Angels and St. Michael the Archangel to defend us in this battle, this spiritual warfare, so that we might be faithful to Christ our King. Ave Maria. Mm-hmm.